the idea with bias the reference counting is the observation that most uh, python variables will only ever be accessed by a single thread so the bias there is that you will probably not access this like variable if over from outside a thread uh hi <laughs> yeah uh so i am tushar i am uh, one of the language engineers here at deep source i mainly work with python i think i have been doing python for what 7 8 years now i guess something like that python has like been changing at sort of an unprecedented rate in today's day it's a bit crazy it's fairly hard to to keep up as well like like if you're like not aware of the the like the developments basically every part of python has been swapped out with something new like how many of you knew that uh, uh, python had the fastest sorting algorithm mm. like of like any language available okay uh, do you know the name of that sorting algorithm yeah yeah tim sort right uh, yeah tim sort was named after this guy tim peters like who has been contributing to python since but something th uh, 30 something years now well tim sort is no longer the sorting algorithm in python that was replaced in 2021 i think late 21 like an even faster algorithm has been put into python and yeah that was 2 years ago and uh, like everything from python's tokenizer to the type system to to the entire grammar to how the eval loop works how the interpreter works how it caches things basically everything has changed in the past 2 to 3 years and uh, this is probably one of the biggest and the most disruptive changes that is about to come in the next couple years or so and uh, yeah it has to do with the gil or the gil the like, guy is going to call it gil like like you can decide whether it's like like a the gil or gil between yourself but yeah i'm going to call it gil and uh, yeah so this they like, talk is about that and like, i think it's something that all of you should be aware of because they like, get going to change drastically how you think about writing python code so yeah that's kind of what the talk is about so the first of all like what exactly is the gil so it stands for a uh, global the global interpreter lock and like it's uh, somewhat of an implementation detail of python uh, now the definition of it is a bit long winded so i'm just like going to open the glossary page Python has a really nice glo th th glossary page, by the way. Like, like you should go ahead and read the entire thing if possible. But yeah, where were we? Yeah. So, the global interpreter lock is the mechanic, the mechanism used by. Wait, where did it go? Come on. Yeah. The the, the mechanism like used by the C Python interpreter to, to assure that only one thread executes Python bytecode at a time, and that gets. like it simplifies the c python implementation by making the object model implicitly safe against concurrent access that's kind of the textbook definition of the global interpreter lock well like in my own terms it's basically a giant lock and the like i guess we are going to like get into what a lock is like a bit later but the important part that you should take away from that definition is that python cannot multi thread but they like, could uh, like some of you might say wait python has threads so python has the threading module like it has i think uh, three different modules to create threads right now uh, but uh, yeah the problem is the threads don't really run at the same time like only one of them like runs sort of at a time so it's kind of like hard to understand just by words so i think i'm just gonna do a tiny little demo for that yeah, okay that works yeah so uh we kind of have a dummy like a fibonacci implementation that's like really slow to kind of like create a node for the program 
and like so what we are going to do is uh, like we're going to take the start time and like we are going to calculate uh, like the 36th uh, our fibonacci number very very slowly eight times and we're going to see how long that takes that's basically what the program is so yeah if we try to run that it takes a while like that's going to happen eight times all right uh, yeah did i mention python is fairly slow uh, yeah seven i believe eight yeah so that took 12.7 seconds all right now we have the separate program uh, wait 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 yeah let me open it up first yeah so we have the concurrent version oh, think of the like the fibonacci calculator so like uh, we are going to the create a thread pool with eight threads and uh, like we are going to spawn the eight separate threads that calculate uh, take that each calculate fibonacci of 36 and let's take a look at how long that takes yeah so uh, the the long and short of that is it's still going to be slow but the like so the previous one took 12.7 make seconds and this took 13.1 seconds so it was actually a bit slower uh, but the important thing to note here is that the results kind of came together at the same time and that's because the threads are actual threads like they're like spawning the eight separate threads on the machine the problem is Python makes sure that only like one of them you can actually do the calculations at a time. So like even though the workload has been spread between these eight separate threads, it's kind of just like a hodgepodge way of doing single thread calculation. Yeah, so like the Python has threads, but it doesn't have uh, parallelism like like, like it cannot do work parallelly with those threads. So what's the point of these threads then? Like why would there be three different modules in Python to start threads and like the thing do all that? What's the point? Well, uh, threads are still like useful in Python, but like they're only useful for IO bound operations. And uh, the like the generic demo for that would be something like trying to download uh, 10 files together. So say that you were doing that like a, so without spawning any threads. The, the problem here will be that waiting for every single network packet to, to arrive, the process will kind of be sleeping. Like it will be doing nothing. Like uh, say that this, like a uh, first part of sending a request, this takes uh, say 100 microseconds. And then the, the thread uh, sleeps for 800 microseconds. And then saving to disk also takes 100 microseconds. So, take, uh, th so for one packet, we took uh, like one millisecond of time, but 80% of that was just wasted, right? So if you were to spawn like uh, four different threads here and uh, like try to run them together, so what happens is this waiting time, like, like it actually gives time uh, for the other threads like to start running. So because if like one of the threads is sleeping, like a separate thread can start the process of sending the request and saving to disk and sending the request and saving to disk and so on. So this is kind of the point of threads in Python like as it is right now. And uh, like uh, from there, we should uh, probably consider what was going on with like, like with the whole locking thing. Why do we have this lock that uh, the prevents multiple threads to run at the same time? Like every other language that, that you probably know of, lets you run multiple threads at the same time and doesn't have this problem. Uh, like Java lets you do it, Go lets you do it, why can't Python? Well, uh, the thing with the GIL is that, like it was a choice that Python made around 30 years ago. Now 30 years ago, multi-core processors were not really a, like, a, like a popular thing. So that's like an implementation detail that, like, that Python picked up. Now it's like not necessary for Python to have a GIL. It's just that, like, like till now, there had not like been a better way to do it. 
without compromising single thread performance. Now, the thing, like, the thing that's important about the GIL is that, like, it does not necessarily make Python slow. Like, in fact, it probably makes Python faster for single thread applications. And for the longest time, Python was like mainly used in single thread applications, which were scripts and like uh, like many other similar programs, kind of like Bash. So that's kind of why there ha like has been a global interpreter lock in Python. Like like so not only does it uh, keep the like the implementation of Python uh, fairly simple, it also keeps it fairly fast because like all the data structures that are like written in the C interpreter, like like all the objects, all the dictionaries, all the lists, they don't have to like a worry about being thread safe and like doing a bunch of locking and un like unlocking. So we like basically trained that with having a single thread that like like a, like a does not have to worry about locking at all. So this was the case until 2016, where this uh, like old dude named uh, the, the Larry Hastings came along and he was like, hey, uh, I don't like this. Like every, other, like every other language that I use, they like, uh, the can do free threading where they, like, we don't have to worry about this big old lock that like everyone just like uh, keeps talking about in Python. That hey, it's good, it makes single thread serve faster. So he like went ahead and he announced that, hey, I'm going to take the gil out of Python. And he called the project the gilectomy. Uh, the idea of that project was fairly simple. Just make replace this giant gill with tiny locks, and uh, like every single like uh, mutable operation that happens inside like the interpreter in C, like uh, we replace that like uh, with a very small lock. They can they can they can unlock. That's what every other language does. So like why not do it in Python? So like that's like a sort of the thing like that he went ahead with, and uh, yeah, uh, th like, uh, th like, uh, turns out doing something like that is really slow. Uh, like by the end of the project, they like, the like Larry like, like had realized that the like, adding these bunch of locks like instead of a single lock will. Like it will like uh, speed up like multi-thread processes for sure, but single-thread py like Python performance like like it will be hurt by up to sixty percent. Like if we were to like do the change that he did in, like in the Gilectomy. So like like would you trade sixty percent of single-thread performance just to be that like whenever uh, you're able to like spawn many threads, you get maybe some more performance. I don't think that's the best choice. So that's why that project basically went nowhere. Yeah, that's until 2019, where, like where this, uh, like the smart little, the fellow called Sam Gross, the came along and he was like, hey, so I think I can do this better. So uh, like, click, there's a little detail here, which is mentioned in this document. So he went ahead and like wrote this giant document called Multithread Python Without the Gill. And the like the nice part about this document was that it was like way more thorough. Like way, way more thorough. But yeah, the the sort of most important thing that's like defined in this document is this was uh, the specific part. So there was a, like a new technique whose uh, like, like which was sort of discovered in 2018 called biased reference counting. Now that's the difference like a bit like the main difference between the Gilectomy project and the current like no gil project which like came out of this Google Doc in 2019. Uh, like like if you were to take to notice uh, the Gilectomy. Like, they get, uh, tried to leverage this thing to, uh, called atomic reference counting to be able to deal with like multiple threads still having to count num like the number of references that an object holds in Python. But the problem to, like with atomics is that at the CPU level, it's still like a fairly slow operation compared to just 
like adding a bunch of integers together. So this like a new idea of biased take reference counting said that that it would solve that problem. And yeah, like there were a bunch of like uh, different changes as well, such as the deferred reference counting and uh, like like um, this like new malloc implementation, uh, like which was uh, like uh, thread safe called mimalloc. Uh, Python's implementation of uh, malloc, like like it was not uh, the thread safe at all, but like uh, like uh, like like not only was mimalloc thread safe, but it was also faster. And uh, yeah, similarly other like techniques like immortalization and like a few more that are like a, a probably one too many to like directly name in the talk. Like you can go ahead and like read the entire document for that. Like it's the, uh, quite a good document. I'll be, like I'll be honest. But yeah, the the thing with uh, like this doc was that like due to its like like details and this new discovery of this thing called biased reference counting. Turns out that you can do the exact same idea of uh, uh, taking this giant lock and turning it into tiny, tiny locks uh, without harming single thread. So, like uh, performance by a lot. Uh, and in 2022, three years later, that kind of turned like, into the current idea of PEP703. And uh, the the thing with the pep is that uh, Sam had like like a sort of a long game plan with his document, where from 2019 onwards, like he started the contributing to C Python some things that like don't depend on uh, the entire yeah, like let's like get rid of the GIL and like break everything. Like all the other good things that could be implemented, such as the better malloc, like, like the, which also happened to be faster, and like the idea of immortalization and everything, like, like these are all like already like uh, present in Python by the like by the release of uh, three eleven, and like he believed that they, like that's the right time to actually go ahead, like and write a pep, so that like we can sort of make do a like a request for comments, where like uh, he can try to explain like how this the project can now be viable. So let's actually take a look at what's going on here. Well, uh, the thing with this pep is that it's like even more longer than the Google Doc. But the, like the basic idea here is that uh, they, the Python does a bunch of reference counting to make sure that things like that are no longer like reference, like uh, should be garbage collected. Like all that code will like now be uh, like, like it will still go through, but like in a much smarter way. I think I should uh, like try to go through the first implementation to make sure that we can uh, I explain this better. Yeah, so like this was like the the 2016 version of the code, and like let's see if I can try to explain this. Yeah, so the idea was that uh, like the parts that like that would uh, like uh, create this lock that would uh, like a uh, completely f the freeze Python state and like let only one thread run Python code at a time. That was like uh, going to be completely ignored, but things like uh, dictionaries. What would happen is, uh, like whenever, like say you try to like uh, delete an object, uh, like so from inside the dictionary, like like you will do a tiny little lock to make sure that any other thread you cannot like access that dictionary at that specific point. Uh, like like while the deletion is happening. Now once the deletion happens, like, like the lock is unlocked again. So basically we take this giant lock and divide it into hundreds and hundreds of these tiny locks and unlocks. Uh, the work 
and uh, yeah, like uh, PEP 703, like it explains that many of these changes can still be there uh, while having these few differences. Let's see if I can find this. Uh, hmm. Yeah, the performance section. Yeah, right. So, uh, the changes like that were done with the biased reference counting method, like like they would uh, like decrease Python's uh, single thread performance by like about 1.5 percent. Like like that was the discovery that was made by Sam Gross in 2019. So similarly, uh, by doing biased standard deferred reference counting, like there would be about a 4 percent hit to single thread performance, and uh, like a few other changes, uh, like uh, to cause like a few more slowdowns, but the 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 thing here is that that's like way lower than the 60 percent dip that had happened in 2016. Now uh, the pep has been like mostly accepted at this point, which means that that like in the next few years these changes will be going into mainline Python. While uh, the like the core maintainers, they have the option to try and revert this based on like like how the results like could turn out in the end. But uh, like there is a pretty good chance that this like change will probably go through. But why like like that's a good thing, right? Like uh, sure, like some one to five percent dip. Thing is going to happen in uh, Python's single thread performance, but we're going to see like a bunch of improvements, right? Now, like, like there are a few like a problems here that that for the like next uh, two to three years, you can expect that like there's going to be two separate versions of Python for a while, uh, and that should remind you of the Python two to Python three change that happened what, 10 years ago now? Some people are still using Python 2. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, the the problem there is that like a lot of people are like very skeptical about that. Python 2 to Python 3 change broke so many people's code and like so much had to be re like, like rewritten that like there is still backlash right, from that. Some people are like, hey, I don't care about like, like multi-thread code. Like, like, let my Python be fast as it is. And the third big problem is for library maintainers for packages that are like, like very important these days, like, like, like NumPy, like PyTorch, like TensorFlow, like Pandas, and like 90% of things that people like use Python for today. The problem here is that the C like the C API that all these packages depend on will have to be like, like different for Python without the GIL compared to Python with the GIL, which means that all these packages will have to maintain two versions of themselves as well, sort of. Well, that's kind of the theory of it, right? Uh, I think that like like a like this whole idea of yeah, there's a giant lock and then there are tiny locks and like that's why it's faster. I don't think that like that explains it like like very well. So like uh, what I've done here is I've taken the uh, the code that was in uh, the like the like the NoGIL branch that was created by Sam Gross and uh, like I've installed that locally. So this like a specific version uh, that I have here is uh, so like uh, like this like uh, the specific window will have the GIL and this specific window will not have the GIL. Okay, so we are going to see sort of like like what difference does it make for programs. So I think we should. Uh, Start again with the the Fibonacci thing. Okay, so like this program was the spawning eight separate threads, 
and calculating the Fibonacci sequence eight, the eight times. In the like the Python that like the still has the GIL, the threads are sort of working together, but like not really. They're like they're interleaved, but they're not parallel. So it takes about twelve seconds. Sim, uh, but the the Python version the without the GIL with the same code runs in two point eight one seconds. Now that's uh, what uh, six seven times like faster. So you can sort of see that it basically like scales with the number of cores that you have on the machine. Like now this machine I believe has it has eight separate cores. So the code can be up to eight times faster by doing by doing nothing. Like 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 the code in like both of them is the same. Like we're just just spawning a thread, right? So that's basically where the value proposition for the GIL comes in. Now, like we have a like a similar code, uh, which like does a like a thing that's like fairly common with multi-threaded code is trying to access uh, global state. Now, the like the Fibonacci like a sequence like it's a cool demo, but like like no program like like really exists that uh, like like does the entire computation purely. And like it does not interact with the libraries, the objects, and everything at all. So to like sort of try to like to try to simulate what's going on there, we're going to have to do this like little thing where uh, we have like this function which like takes the global variable and it tries to like to increment it like like a million times. Okay, and. Yeah, we do the same thing. Like, so we start eight threads. So we take the like, like, like the, the global variable, and we like like increment it a million times. But like, do the same thing eight times. So the final value here should be yeah, it should be eight million. So like, let's see how that goes here. So that took one point five seven seconds on Python with the GIL. And uh, don't know what's happening here. It took seven point six seven seconds on Python without the GIL. So it's it's kind of flipped, isn't it? Right? It's like it's something like five to six times the, the slower. So like like what exactly happened here? Well, the thing that happened here is lock contention. And that's the one thing that Python, like Python developers, like don't want to think about. So uh, the thing that I glossed over here was this lock. Like, like, like let's actually go ahead and uh, to comment out the lock part. And like, let's see, like, like, like what that does to the Python without the GL. Though it got way faster. Like it ran in 0 0.37 seconds. And uh, yeah, but uh, without the GIL, hey, that is much faster, like 1.6 seconds. Like it's still like slower than uh, uh, like the Python with the GIL, but like it's like way faster, right? But hey, the answer is all messed up. See, that's the thing with locks. Once the global interpreter lock has been taken out of Python, like it's now the responsibility of the Python developers to make sure that whenever multiple threads try to access the same object, that that object is locked. That's why we have to do make like deal with locks, then lock contention, then all of that jazz. Now, single thread Python had not to like did not have to like worry about like any of this at all. Like, uh, like in fact, like like even with the commented out code. It didn't really matter because, yeah, yeah, there were eight threads, but like only like one of the threads like the like was able to run x plus equal to one at a time. So, like all the eight million times, like this happened separately, but this like started clashing while uh, like it ran on multiple threads without the GIL. So that's kinda the entire like a point of 
like like GIL versus no GIL. Like it's not just sunshine and rainbows. Okay, let's actually look at a couple more examples. So uh, the third example I have right here, like like we'll try to explain why uh, the Python like like even like uh, without the lock, uh, the multi-threaded Python is still like uh, slower than the single thread Python. So uh, the thing with like a threads and like lock condition right now is uh, like it can be simulated in the Python like with the GIL with multi-processing. Now the, the difference between multi-threading and multi-processing is that like since multi-processing spawns a completely different process that has a completely different GIL. So your like like so your like Python code it can actually run parallelly to each other. But the problem with that like arrives like when you try to run it. So like like that exact same code like trying to like calculate the eight million number. Huh. It took eleven point four seven seconds and weirdly the value of x at the end is zero. The code is exactly the same. The only thing that has changed like, is that like, we went from a thread pool to a process pool. Now, what exactly happened here is that multiple processes cannot just talk to each other. When you spawn a child process, uh, like all the variables that exist in the file, like everything from this function to, like, to the value in the x to the, to all the imports that you have up top, they will be copied to the new process. So while the child process that thing is like, like doing all the locking and incrementing and locking and like incrementing, that's happening with like the version of X like that exists for that child process. So these eight child processes, they calculated X like third to a million just fine. But like they never got added up to the X that was in the main process. So that's the like like that's the main problem like that existed with multiprocessing, where yeah like a process like like multiprocessing is cool like it lets you run Python parallelly but uh, being able to transfer data between each other is like a like a completely different hassle that I don't want to get into and the thing with like like a Python the, without the GIL is that when you try to spawn threads you get the exact same problem that you get in the current Python with multiple processes. Yeah, like now you can do multiple things at the same time, but you have to worry about things like take, take locking and convention and like and everything. Yeah, it will be a bit faster because the threads are uh, like faster to start up than like, like take an entire new process with the like uh, with a new GIL, but the problems st like uh, still remain. Let's look at uh, program number the four here, where we simply like run uh, uh, like the famous linter flake it uh, with eight different threads on the entirety of the C Python the repository. Like let's run that on uh, Python with the GIL first. Uh, so like like. Like, so it's going to split the repo into like eight different sets of files. Then it's going to process all of them together. And uh, yeah, it looks like with the eight different threads, like it took like around 9.61 seconds. Now, the thing here is that there's no like a, like a global value access. Like even the, like the imports are happening like in here. And like we're not accessing any value. Like that was outside the function. So this is kind of a like a pure function, right? Like this function should run much faster like than the no guild branch. So let's take a look at that. Well, it did run faster from 9.61 seconds to 4.23 seconds, but the speed up is not as high as you would have maybe expected. And the thing here is that the libraries that we use are not currently designed to be completely uh, like uh, the, the compatible with 
the free thread now the flaget uh, like a uh, the, the currently creates like a bunch of these global objects like the application object and then the like the like the checker object that like stores all the results and everything and when like multiple threads are trying to run like on multiple files at the same time they all have to write to these same objects so that creates the same contention that we talked about uh so like even though like the code got faster which is like a good thing uh like it's not necessary that uh like everything will just like magically get faster if you try to write pure python code like uh, like especially with uh, like most code bases like like flake it is like sort of a rare example where it's written like the fairly well like if you like were to try to run like like just any regular old program uh like between the gil the can the no gil version you will probably not find much of a speed boost at all you will have uh, to make significant amount of changes to these programs to make sure that they like they can be good with the free thread and uh, yeah that's sort of the demo that i had for you so yeah let's uh, like talk about like the future that hey the agile is going away that means that we have to start worrying about a bunch of things but we also get free performance sometimes but yeah so what do we do about it yeah so the pep has not been accepted yet but it will be like the the like the current explanation by the steering council is that that sam gross has done a like really good work but a lot of work has still to be done so like like it will be a while before this change gets like accepted into mainline c python probably like it will end up in c python by release 3.14 which is the like, like the py release uh but like in between that time uh it's probably like like a really good idea to go ahead and try like like your own programs and like uh, to be a bit more aware of what this change is going to mean for like to work for your code bases and for your libraries and so on now uh the big thing is that uh the python steering council then like the set of uh, c python code is like that exist they have like they like, learned a fair bit from the change that they that they did in python 2 to python 3 and they they are like very hopeful that the way that they implement this new change will like try not to to affect like most python dev like the like, developers as possible but the like the most important thing there is they require feedback so if like you're a library maintainer make sure to test it the con the the gil the disabled version of python as soon as it comes up like like it will probably be out in somewhere between 6 months and 1 year from now so like if you maintain the, the like a python application or a python library make sure to like to test it on that then if you find that there's like a like a major like a like like a degradation in performance or some things that should be working they like are not working at all make sure to report that because like like if you don't speak up the coders and the maintainers have like no idea what decision to make so yeah that's like a kind of the talk take like a the take like a quick recap python is going to get the, like a true multi threading but they get not as black and white as that as you saw now it can possibly like the speed of your programs by default but you should not rely on that fact but you can start parallelizing a lot of the things in your code base to speed it up going forward and uh, it's going to be like way more simpler than like than multi processing i like like i would assume that some of you have tried to make your code faster by using multi processing like it's a very painful process but yeah with threading like it will be a bit less pain so yeah and uh, like if you have a library like like you should probably start making it thread safe with locks and like stuff like that because people that were writing python code before and like that were using your library that will that like that they kept working like even without 
like any the worries about com- like a, the, like a concurrency control and locks and uh, like make maintaining the correct state but like that's going to change very soon like like even make regular people make running python code will be like 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 using a bunch of threads because like it will give like uh, give them a bunch of th- uh, free performance so that like if you want to make sure that your library still keeps working in that condition it take you should start looking into thread safety as soon as possible and yeah that's basically everything i have uh i have a take a blog where i talk about python and like if you want to talk with me about python you can talk to me on the app that used to be called twitter and yeah like that's it thanks so any questions the the question here was that the the fibonacci code that like 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 it was about yeah like it was about 8 times faster by using eight threads so why not use 12 threads and make it 12 times faster right so yeah let's actually try that cuz why not that is going to take a long time it's going to take like what 20 seconds on the python with the gil yeah come on so okay 19 seconds yep fairly spot on so if you do the same on the python with without the gil yeah it's 4.26 so what does that come out to uh sorry my bad it's about 4.5 times faster it's even slower or oh, no yeah well the limitation is that like you only have eight cores so like take like only eight of them like take will run parallelly so the last four are actually going to run while like like four cores are sleeping so it's going to be even slower so yeah well uh the the best thing that you can do is start using your library with multiple threads and then like you spot a bunch of crashes and <coughs> like a bunch of inconsistent states and things like that and like with like practice and like like a bunch of chat gpt i guess uh <laughs> like things will start making sense yeah let's actually see if i can find it like i think there was a section on yeah so like there will be a how to guide for making packages uh, like a compile like a compatible when running python without the gil so yeah like there will be a like guide shipping with python dot org so uh, the thing with bias like reference counting is uh, okay so for that first we'll have to get into atomics now uh, the previous approach of atomic reference counting uh, now reference uh, take a the take a counting uh, without any threading is fairly simple like when a variable like like a reference is a value take you do references plus equals 1 and like when you delete a variable like 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 by a function exiting or something then like you do minus equals 1 take like now when like you try to make this code the, the thread safe you have to like start making these locks like now the fastest way to make these locks take like is by like by using this thing crypto to call atomics like now atomics are actually a part of the cpu itself where like instead of like using a regular number that can like the take get fudged up like we saw like like when we tried to run that uh, the increment example the without locking the number got completely messed up right with uh, like numbers so that are atomic that will never happen and like that's a feature of the cpu itself that like like whenever that number gets changed that gets changed uh, like instantly uh, for every single part take of the cpu for every single thread to for every single cache that has the uh, currently cached the take the value of that number inside the cpu take take it changes everywhere but the problem with that is that it's about twice as slow take as like take regular numbers so so that was the main problem with the implementation with atomic reference counting that's what made it so slow 
the idea with biased reference counting is the observation that most uh, Python variables will only ever be accessed by a single thread. So the bias there is that you will probably not access this big variable if from outside the thread. So what the implementation does is it like treats uh, like the reference count just as a take a regular number for as long as it can. But as soon as something from a separate thread like tries to reference that take that variable, so that threads are like a variable sh shared between multiple threads now, that like there will be a like a separate counter. So and that separate counter will be like like maintained with a like like an atomic value. Yeah, exactly. So like that's kind of like the idea behind re like bias reference counting. Then like that's what makes it so fast like in practice. Uh, the the thing with async IO is that the entirety of the like the library, the entirety of the like the event loop, will have to be made thread safe in the program itself. Now the good news is it's basically already thread safe right now because people do use async IO while spawning multiple threads. Uh, but uh, like, like that has not been the highest uh, priority right now. So there, like, like, like there may be hidden bugs which may be revealed once basically everyone starts using free threads. So, yeah, like it, like, yeah, in theory, it should not affect async IO much. But yeah, we'll have to see how that is. So. Uh, there was like a like a new pep recently. I think it was pep six six eighty eight or something, which was uh, Python having sub interpreters. Now the idea with uh, sub interpreters is kind of like multi processing, but sub interpreters uh, have like a kind of like the idea of like a Docker image where the kernel is shared. So like 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 the Docker containers starts up like very fast and it like runs very fast and like there's no loss of performance but it's like uh, still isolated so the idea with like sub interpreters is fairly similar that like we have completely separate state and completely like separate like clean like, gils but the like like the the eval loop that's like running the bytecode will be like shared between the interpreters so like it's Kind of like going from a virtual machine to like a Docker container, but in practice, it's not that much faster. Now it can help, like especially with like when you have to do a lot of inter-process communication in case of multiprocessing. If you switch to sub interpreters instead, it will probably speed up your code by a fair bit. But it's mostly not relevant, and like the the interesting thing is that Python three twelve has introduced this sub interpreters idea but with pep 703 it's basically going to be like irrelevant because the gil is going away anyway so yeah like that's what like, like that's what i was saying python is changing so rapidly that it's kind of like stepping over it like itself at that many points but yeah yeah okay so there was a bit of a drama between the two groups. Like if you didn't know, like Sam Gross is like a principal engineer at Facebook. He's the, the maintainer of PyTorch. Yeah, like a fairly smart fellow. Uh, but there's a team at Microsoft, which is the, the faster C Python team. And uh, they are trying to, like both of them are trying to make C Python faster, but both of them have vastly different approaches. So uh, yeah, the the problem here is both of them want to do good with Python, but are uh, like there was a fair bit of drama where the team at Microsoft like they, they it was like, hey, can you like not accept this JL removal change so like so quickly because it's going to completely mess up our plans. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, like that took uh, like a few months to get resolved. 
but the core devs have talked to both teams and both their ideas have been solidly accepted. So, yeah, the like, like, like the good part is that their ideas will try to like be mingled together. Then in the end, like, like we get an even faster Python than we would have gotten with like like a singular approach. So yeah. Mojo, oh right. <laughs> okay, so there's a separate project by the creator of, uh, I think, Swift and uh, the creator of LLVM. Like if you know, fairly big deal. And the creator of MLIR, the reason why all the machine learning libraries are in Python. Uh, the, like that guy was like, hey, Python is great. I want to make it faster. So I'm going to create a super set of Python, which will be compiled. And it will run so much faster that that you have no idea. So, yeah, like that project is called like like the Mojo. Like it's uh, full of fire emojis and blazingly fastest. Uh, so that's going on. That project is not even close to being usable right now. That's the sad part. But like if like someone has the like the credentials to say that. Yeah, I can compile like, like a version of Python and make it super fast. That person would be that guy. But yeah, like I guess we'll have to wait and watch for that as well. And yeah, like like that, like in the ideal world, like like uh, Mojo will be dozens of times faster than the Python version that ends up like like, like that we end up with right now. But Mojo is a very, very hard project. So yeah, like we'll have to see how that goes. Okay, anything else? Yeah, I guess that's all. Uh, okay.